Okay, microphone works, very good, yes. Okay, um, so this, this morning I started talking about um, uh, supergravity. It's an on-shell version, it's an off-shell version. And of course the off-shell version is a little bit more complicated. And um, so now I want to go to n equals 2, or extended supergravity, where we have two gravitini. And um, uh, I will discuss a, little, a few aspects of black hole physics already here. And um, of course there's also, yeah. Um, there's also the off-shell version that I will discuss, but first, uh, the first part of this lecture is about the on-shell. So let me start with uh, writing down uh, models or actions. Um, and before, well, the lunch, I already gave the counting argument, the on-shell counting arguments, why in n equals two supergravity, we need a graviton, but also a gravi-photon, and we need two gravitini. And so, um, well, minus g, the action uh, can be written very simple. I counts the uh, gravitini, I runs from one to two. And so, this is, of course, not the most general supergravity theory. It is, it's, in fact, it's quite the opposite. It's the minimal supergravity theory because it doesn't couple to any matter fields. There is no, there's of course a gauge field, but it's part of the Poincaré multiplet, the, the, the multiplet that is needed to make uh, the um, general coordinate transformations um, 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 symmetries. And so uh, later on, or maybe probably even tomorrow, we're going to couple this to vector multiplets and hypermultiplets. And uh, these constructions are actually much more uh, involved. And to do that properly, you need that off-shell and superconformal methods to, to write down and to, to find these matter-coupled supergravities. And so, but for today's purposes, uh, uh, um, I, I'm going to um, just work with the minimal supergravity. Yeah? So this is minimal n equals 2, d equals 4, supergravity. So the minimal refers not to the minimal amount of supersymmetry, it refers to the minimal, minimal that there's no coupling to other fields. So um, th these lectures are also supposed to be about black holes. So I want to quickly discuss the black hole uh, solutions. And so um, you can write down the equations of motions. Now we have, of course, the possibility to um, have a rational nerstrom black hole solution, which is electrically, possibly also magnetically charged. This is Einstein-Maxwell theory, and so you can write down um, ds squared. This is uh, the metric <coughs> over r plus q squared g 4 pi r squared dt squared. Um, well, the relation between kappa and g newton is kappa squared equals 8 pi gn. I'm using the conventions of the book of Ferrara and Van Puyen, uh, Friedman and Van Puyen, apologies. You can erase this from the camera. Uh. Um. Here's the same function. And I guess everybody has seen this. Uh, um, these are spherically symmetric black holes which have uh, electric charge. The electric charge is given by Q. The mass is given by M. And there is also a field strength. Of course, you have to solve for the field strength as well. And there is one component, FTR, for an electrically charged black hole minus Q over 4 pi R squared, the standard electric field that belongs to a particle with charge uh, uh, Q. So this is the reichner nerstrom solution that lives happily in n equals 2, minimal supergravity. Uh, the gravitino is set to zero in this solution. And so this is a black hole 
that has an inner and an outer, outer horizon. So pictorially, this is the uh, R minus and R plus. These horizons can be found by studying the zeros of this, of this function here. And so there's two horizons, R plus and R minus equals uh, mg plus or minus square root for pi. And um, so you see that something special happens when this uh, square root is equal to zero. This happens essentially in the appropriate units when the mass is equal to the charge then the square root is zero, and the outer and the inner horizon uh, coincide. That is the solution also that is called the extremal solution. And if you embed this in supergravity, which is the case here, it preserves uh, half of the um, supercharges. So you can look at the variations of the Gravitini. They depends, there's a covariant derivative that both contains uh, f mu nu and the spin connection. You have to compute and compute. And then you find one solution for the killing spinner. Uh, that killing spinner is actually explicitly written in the book uh, uh, by Friedman and Van Poyen. Um, yeah, now it's uh, interesting to make jokes about the, the book by Friedman and De Witt. Uh. <laughs> um, so, good. So, um, in this case here, in this model of supergravity, uh, it happens to be so that uh, the extremality conditions coinciding um, horizons is uh, the same thing as uh, preserving some supersymmetry. So only at that point, uh, when these coincide, that you have a BPS solution. That's, that happens in many cases in supergravity, but it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not always the case. There are also examples where you have extremal black holes, especially in matter coupled and especially in ADS, where you have extremal black holes that uh, are not supersymmetric. Uh, and so um, one has to specify a little bit the assumptions under which this uh, uh, is correct and not correct, but in, in these simple models, that is, uh, that is the case. Good, um, so this is the electrically charged uh, black hole solution. There's also a black hole solution that has both an electric and a magnetic uh, solution. Uh, and so, well, I will write that here. That has a solution FTR equals minus Q over four pi R squared. And F theta phi equals minus I over four pi P sine theta. And so this is dual magnetic field strength, if you want. And so then um, the metric here, um, uh, in, in the metric, you can just change the Q over here, or the Q squared goes into Q squared plus P squared. And um, in fact, you can also see that um, um, the charge cannot be too large. If the charge is, is going to be too large, this term all, always dominates over this one. And then something dangerous happens uh, at r equals 0. You get naked singularities. And so to avoid naked singularities, We must have that um, q squared plus p squared must be smaller than 4 pi m squared over g. And when the equation is satisfied, or when the inequality is satisfied, that's precisely the case of extremality, uh, which is demonstrated here for p equals 0. When p is equal to 0, q equals m squared is precisely when this uh, is vanishing. But in general, um, the charge cannot be too large because then you create naked singularities. You want to avoid that, but also, if you try to make such black holes, cosmic censorship uh, um, prevents you from uh, doing that by physical processes. Although these physical processes depend on a, or, or, or these theorems, they depend on certain assumptions. And, uh, but for this type of matter, um, 
these naked singularities can always be uh, avoided. So this looks like a bound on the charges in terms of the mass. If you combine this with the super algebra, you f figure out that uh, this is precisely also a bound on the uh, uh, central charge of the supersymmetry algebra. I won't go much into detail, but I might explain it a little bit more uh, later or, to, or tomorrow. Um. Yes. Uh, what is written here? Yes. Minus i, imaginary Minus unit. I. Yes. Oh, there, uh, yes, it's also not in my notes, but I'm, I'm sure there's some power of r. That's what you say, right? No, no, the I. Uh, Why the i is there? Um, that cannot be correct. Um, <laughs> That is to do with the conventions in, uh, in the book. Uh, here it's called the dual, uh, and that involves an epsilon tensor, and the epsilon tensor, yeah. <laughs> Let's do it this way. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, well, that could be, okay. Uh, I'll give you the phone number of uh, from yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll give you the phone number of uh, von Nieuwenhuizen and Peter West. Uh, um, very good. So um, this is the solution. This is the bound, uh, and so these are not the uh, when the bound is satisfied, it's supersymmetric. But these are not the only supersymmetric solutions. There are, uh, these are the only supersymmetric solutions for spherically symmetric uh, objects. There are also objects that describe uh, multi-centered black holes. Um, and um, they are called the Papapetru Majumdar solutions. So they, these are metrics of the following form, uh, minus e to the 2u of x. I'm just slight, you know, I'll write down this form for u in a moment, plus e to the minus t u of x. And then we have dx dot dx. And then e to the minus u has a particular form. It is a harmonic function on R3. These are the coordinates that involve the radial direction and the two angles. Um, and then, uh, and A of t is equal to well, one over square root um, four pi g e to the u. Um, so these are BPS solutions, and by BPS solutions, I already mean that, well, that they preserve supersymmetry, but also here, uh, you see there's no Q here. It's already assumed that the, that the mass of the black hole is related to the, to the charge uh, in the same way for each center. So we have multiple centers. We have N, N centers here, and each of them carries a black hole with mass Mi and charge Qi, uh, but Qi is related to Mi via this, uh, uh, this relation with the equality here. There is a multi-center yeah. version with photoelectric and magnetic charge? Yes, uh, there is. In fact, it, it takes exactly this form here where uh, the uh, 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 you should have field strength around each center, and then the MI, let's see, the MI uh, is related to well, one over four pi g. Yeah. So what you switch on? Well, of course it depends on the gauge here, but you switch on a a phi. Uh, and it looks, uh, I didn't write down the expression in my notes, but it can be written down. And this is the relation between mass and charges. Are these solutions or these 
They are BPS solutions, so they are one half BPS. And this is a reflection of the fact that they are uh, BPS. Otherwise, um, um, you would already see that in the case of one center, it's not the most general solution because the mass and the charge are related. Yeah. Okay, are there any more questions about this? Good, uh, then I'll, uh, before I go to off-shell stuff, um, I'll quickly repeat this program uh, in the presence of a cosmological constant. So uh, also this morning when I did uh, n equals one supergravity, then uh, I added this, a small deformation and the deformation was adding a cosmological constant and uh, in such Lagrangians for supergravity, anti de Sitter uh, is a solution and this we call anti de Sitter supergravity. And there's also a simple version uh, of anti de Sitter supergravity for n equals two. And um, let me discuss that briefly. Maybe anticipating on what I'm going to do tomorrow and Wednesday, um, we're going to discuss gauge supergravities. And so what is there to be gauged? Well, what is there to be gauged uh, in this case, for instance, is, uh, well, we have here a vector field and we have fermions. And you can ask the question, is the fermion neutral under this, under this U1 or not? In a normal supergravity, it's not. In this covariant derivative, there is not an A mu here. Um, and if you do that, you can make a theory in which this is a local symmetry. And that is, that is called gauge supergravity. So essentially what you do is you take this Lagrangian and you do the following uh, manipulate or substitutions. You substitute into this covariant derivative already contains a spin connection. But now on top of it, you add a gauge field. Um, like this, and um, that's right, or oh, plus in my notes, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'm using here different conventions perhaps than in, in the book, because this is not part of the book. And so you do that here in the action, uh, and then you also add um, a term here, um, times, well, r, of course, and then there is a term 6g squared. Uh, and I have to double check whether there's other uh, fermion bilinears uh, in the action appearing. Uh, well, the answer is yes, but you can usually put that in a 1.5 formalism in the spin connection. Um, so, well, it's not very relevant for what I'm going to say. So there's a cosmological constant, and the cosmological constant is given by minus 3g. Uh, I think in the notation of this morning, g was 1 over l, the ADS radius. And now I call it a coupling constant because I want to make it look like it's a gauging. I'm gauging something here. There's a covariant derivative um, with coupling constant g. So this is the theory. Uh, you can write down the supersymmetry transformation rules. Uh, yes. Um, well, in the n equals 1 case, we didn't have a gauge field that was not part of the Poincaré multiplet. You can still give it an interpretation in terms of gauging, but then you have to, have to explain a few more things that you are gauging. You're, 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 you're using an additional compensating multiplet, which contains a vector multiplet, and then you can use that gauge field to do a gauging. Um, uh, here I have it already present and you, you can sensibly ask the question, can you give the Gravitino a charge under this, uh, under this gauge field? The answer is yes, if you do that, uh, it, it, it is, um, well you can give it whatever name you want, gauge supergravity or deformed supergravity. Um, you can understand it as a gauging because I'm, 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 I'm covariantizing this action here. And I could not do that this morning because there was no gauge field present. Of gauge supergravity, so but they're not. No, they're not, yes. 
There, this is part of a bigger framework in which this whole gauging procedure becomes, uh, well, becomes something very simple, uh, namely this. Uh, so ADS supergravities and gauge supergravities. ADS supergravity is, a, is just a, uh, an example of, a simple example of a gauge supergravity. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Yes. So the gauge supergravity does have flat solutions. Flat solutions? Which are not ADS. Well, no, Minkowski space is not is not a solution here unless uh, well unless you switch off the gauging uh, g equals zero. So flat space time is not a solution of this theory. Well, it is a solution of this theory, but not of this theory. So all the space times here, so onto the sitter in four dimensions is a solution of this equation. And what I'm going to write down now is, and now I'm going to put, put a black hole into onto the sitter and uh, uh, that asymptotes to uh, um, ADS. So Minkowski space is not a solution of this uh, theory unless you put G equals zero, but then go back to the ungauged theory. So we can write down metrics, ds squared equals um, I'm going to discuss the reichner nurstrom type solutions, <coughs> u squared of r dt squared plus u minus 2 of r. Yeah, sometimes I use e to the u, sometimes u. F forgive me my notations. Uh, that's because this part here is not, uh, is not covered in the book, so I took this from another paper. I um, might want to call this u tilde or something. Um, where, uh, so, so the reichner nurstrom in ADS4 looks as follows. So it is u squared of r equals 1 minus 2m over r plus q electric squared plus, now I'm also putting um, uh, g newton to 1. Like this? Yeah. <laughs> I switched from Russian to to Italian. Um, very good. So um, so this is a solution to the equations of motion here. Uh, and you see, for instance, if you put all these charges to zero and the mass to zero, then it's just one plus g squared r squared, that's just anti de Sitter space with nothing in it. Uh, and then you can put an object in anti de Sitter space. You could give it mass and charge, m, q, uh, q electric and q magnetic. And here are the expressions for the gauge field. You can ask yourself, which of these solutions is supersymmetric? Um, and this problem was analyzed, well, a long time ago by Romans. So the BPS solutions in a paper, uh, by Larry Romans in 92. He uh, took this class of solutions and, and plugged it into the variations of the Gravitino and, and set that to zero and see for which constraints on the parameters can you get a supersymmetric uh, BPS solution. So, uh, so the BPS solutions are, there's two classes, the first class is the class uh, where the magnetic charge is equal to zero and the mass is equal to Q electric. And then that one is one half BPS. And what we have then is U squared is equal to one minus Q, QE squared over R squared plus G squared R squared. So, um, that follows from imposing uh, supersymmetry. Not the 
Yes, of course. Yeah. It's also wrong in my notes. Um, very good. So you see that U is always a positive, uh, it's a sum of two positive terms. And um, in the absence of a cosmological constant, there was no such thing. And this function had zeros. If this function has zeros, it's precisely where the horizon is. And the horizon would be then at Q, uh, well, uh, at R equals Q, I'm sorry. Uh, but now in the presence of this term, you see that there is no zero of this, uh, of this function. That means there is no horizon. And so the point R equals zero, is still where the metric shows singularities, and that's a naked singularity. So this is a BPS solution of an electrically charged object, if you want, but it has a naked singularity. So here you see that in anti de Sitter or in gauge supergravity, the notion of, of the uh, BPS, well, the, the, the cosmic censorship and the, the BPS condition they are two different concepts in the sense that imposing BPS is not imposing satisfying the BPS bound and avoiding naked, naked singularities. So no magnetic charge and mass equal to electric charge. The second class of solutions is called the cosmic dion. Well, it has mass equal to zero we have to carefully define what we mean by mass and ADS, but okay. If we just see there's a parameter here, uh, it's m equals zero, and then q m is equal to plus or minus one over two g, and the electric charge can be anything. And if you take this choice here, the function u then becomes u squared is g r plus 1 over 2 g r squared plus q electric squared over r squared. And you see again that uh, this is the sum of positive terms. It has no zero, uh, so that means no horizon, and so also a naked singularity. Uh, both this one has naked singularity and this one has naked singularity at r equals zero. This cosmic dion solution here um, preserves not one quarter BPS, uh, one half BPS, but one quarter BPS. That's a feature that we're going to see uh, again in anti de Sitter uh, uh, space times. You can have one quarter BPS solutions in n equals two supergravity, so they preserve two, super two supercharges out of eight. Yes. These are eight supercharges, two Majoranas, and one Majorana is four real degrees of freedom. You have two of them, so that's eight. One half BPS means it preserves four supercharges, one quarter means it preserves two supercharges. In ungauged supergravity or minimal supergravity, there's no one quarter uh, BPS solutions. Very good. So actually, for a long time, it was thought that um, in anti de Sitter, there is no interesting black hole physics uh, to be done uh, with BPS solutions, uh, sort of partly because of this reason. Uh, there were no honest to God, uh, uh, at least in, in those days. And um, of course, later on, um, various people have contributed to it. Um, um, a black hole solution was, uh, a spherically symmetric black hole solution was, uh, uh, found uh, uh, by yeah, Clement Cacciatore, um, which has magnetic charge, uh, and but you need to add scalar fields. You need to go to matter coupled supergravity, and so this is also what I will do. And I think that that's also one of the uh, black hole solutions that will be discussed in Alberto's uh, talk, I suppose. Uh, and so uh, we'll get to that point. Okay. Are there any questions? <coughs> Yes. In previous lecture, we obtained uh, all the minima version. In this case, we form a dynamic term for anger. But now we have an accurate term for how do we get this version? How do we get what? How do we? Version from non dynamic. So, um, 
I'm not entirely sure I, I understood the question. So, so this morning I did n equals one supergravity. There was no a mu. Uh, and now with n equals two, with extended supersymmetry, I have an a mu because I need to match the, on shell, I need to match the degrees of freedom. But that's maybe not your question. Yes, that's right. That's an n equals one. There, a mu is an auxiliary field. Uh, here, it's not an auxiliary field. It propagates and it has a standard uh, uh, kinetic, uh, kinetic term. I will now go to the off-shell formulation of n equals two supergravity. And lots of stuff happens there and it becomes complicated. Uh, um, but I, I want to talk you through this. Yes, please. the black hole, so you put a mass in the gravity, and then you can construct, like you can find black hole solution. I mean, uh, but here, why we we cannot just turn off the electric field, the electro electromagnetism, and then you just uh, put a, a massive term to the you, the yeah, but this is a math for the gravitinos. So if you want to look for bosonic solutions, of course this this this. This, 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 this includes also you can switch off the electromagnetic field uh, 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 and then, then you have a Schwarzschild black hole in onto the sitter, uh, which is just, contains just these, this term, 1 minus 2m plus g squared r squared. That's the solution of both n equals 2 supergravity. No, no, no g, so it, it not be ADS, right? Well, you can s then also switch on or off g. Um, if you also switch that off, then you have the Schwarzschild solution. Um, if you switch it on. But not ADS. So I, I said it wrong. It was ADS. So can, can we add a master to the gravitino and find ADS solution in equals to 2 without talking about that? Okay. Yeah, but this, this master, this master was a, ma well, it's a mass like, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a bilinear term in the fermions. Uh, maybe it was a bit confusing to call that mass. Um, maybe not. Um, but we're looking for black hole solutions where the gravitino are set to zero. All these solutions have psi equals zero. So, okay, but my question is about ADS. It's not about black hole. So, uh, okay. Uh, yes. Uh, I would like to know if it's possible to find ADS solutions for n equals to two subjects, put in a mass term as we did in equals to one. Equals to one. Sure. Just put m to zero and all the q's to zero. Just take this term and this term. Then ADS is a solution. And that's a maximally supersymmetric solution. It, it preserves all the supercharges. We can split that too. Yeah, yeah. So that mass term, what you call mass term, that sits somewhere in here, uh, but that uses 1.5 formalism. I didn't want to go in there. Uh, uh, yes. Um, it, 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 there was here a dot, dot, dot. But these terms are there, yes. Stefan? Yes. Uh, when you have mass term, can you have Static, one of BTS electrically charged black hole. No, they they will uh, they will have naked singularities. But uh, is a theorem or is just a um, experimental fact? If you put rotation, you can have those, right? If you turn off rotation, um, because there was a similar logo theorem for the magnetic. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I uh, always have to be careful with calling uh, with with theorems. Um, I, I don't know of a theorem or where that would be written, um, but I don't know any example either. But perhaps somebody in the audience uh, can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, don't think so. Good. Um, good. Um, now we go to, um, so this is all I have to say about minimal, ga minimal supergravity um, in its on-shell version. I will now discuss a few elements of off-shell supergravity. And so we'll have to go uh, through the whole business of the wild multiplet. And so this wild multiplet and, and the coupling to supergravity that was developed in the 80s by um, De Witt and Van Poorien. And so I had to learn this stuff as well at some point. Um, very good. So 
of shell n equals 2 supergravity. You see, for the purposes of localization, this off-shell um, uh, business is, is important, or at least there's lots of advantages. It's not compulsory, uh, but when you work on shell, uh, you have to study uh, case by case, model by model, because the field equations vary from model to model. So you can have off-shell formulations, the whole program of localization uh, in field theory, but also, in fact, uh, uh, if you want to do something more than just uh, explaining the leader, leading order entropy of black holes, then, um, well, Samir uh, will um, um, discuss that. Uh, uh, Atish also knows much more about it than I do. Very good. So let me uh, give you some basics on this. So we do the same kind of tricks conceptually. I'm not doing anything different from this morning. What we want to do is we want to um, construct supergravity by first consider or constructing a uh, bigger theory that has more symmetries, namely the symmetries realized by the superconformal algebra, and then we gauge fix. We gauge fix those generators in the superconformal algebra that are not part of the Poincaré. That's always the same idea, and uh, that trick um, uh, allows us to go off shell because the while multiplet in the superconformal algebra, they are actually it's actually possible to construct that uh, off shell uh, in a not too difficult way. Um, so, um, so we need the superconformal methods. And so we need the n equals 2 while multiplet. And I'm going to just, uh, for the moment, um, just give you, again, a counting, a counting uh, device how to see that things are, uh, can be realized off shell. So the superconformal algebra is now SU 2,2 slash 2. It contains bosonic and fermionic generators. And the bosonic subalgebra of this is SO 4,2 or SO 2,2. Uh, but now the R symmetries are larger. In N equals 2, the R symmetry group is SU 2 cross U1. And in the superconformal theory, this R symmetry is really realized as a symmetry of the Lagrangian. Otherwise, because it's part of the superconformal uh, algebra, the Lagrangian must be invariant under this full group. And on top of it, we have, of course, the Q supersymmetries and the S symmetries, S supersymmetries. Let me repeat, the S supersymmetries are basically the superpartners of the special conformal transformations that sit uh, in here. So when we construct this while multiplet, uh, we have to introduce gauge fields uh, for all these generators, and so, um, let me here make a list of these gauge fields. So we have E mu A, that's basically the metric for general coordinate transfer or for translations. We have B mu for the dilatations. We have V mu I J. These are gauge fields for the R symmetry group. So this is a non-abelian gauge field, if you want, uh, V mu nu, v, v mu I J. Now we have curly A mu. Um, which is the gauge field uh, for this U1 R symmetry. Now, um, we can do a counting again without introducing these compensating multiplets. And if we count here, we counted here that uh, off shell uh, we have six degrees of freedom. But you can use the dilatation, the scale symmetry, to reduce this to five. So this is five, and what I've gauge fixed then are the general coordinate transformations plus the dilatation. That's the same counting as this morning. B mu, same story. It has no uh, uh, off-shell degrees of freedom. The reason is that I'm using special conformal transformations. These are precisely D generators or four generators. I can use them to set B mu equal to zero. So there's no degrees of freedom in here. Now V mu, um, this is an SU2. SU2 has three generators, uh, but I have four components. So I would have a four minus, um, a four times three, that's 12 component fields. But of course there is gauge symmetry, 
There's three generators here, so you get 12 minus three, that's nine degrees of freedom. And AMU, we have four fields, one generator, that's three. Now, um, so if you can. Well, um, well, the, the notation here is just uh, uh, I and J run from one to two, uh, and so uh, if we we're going to covariantize here the. Um, um, uh, the, 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 there's going to be a gauge field acting on the gravitinos with, with, with SU2 labels V mu ij. Uh, yeah, so. um, good, so then we have in the fermionic sector, we have psi mu i alpha, and that's, um, uh, remember that off shell we would have 12 degrees of freedom, but now there is S supersymmetry, so we can reduce that from 12 to 8, but I have two gravitinos, so that's 2 times 8, that's 16. And what is gauge fix here is Q and S. So um, if you now add it up, so we see here that's 12 and that's 5, that's 17. That's 16, so that doesn't quite work. And so, um, um, so we need some more auxiliary fields to make the counting work between bosons and fermions. Now, there's a little bit of a story uh, how people have figured this out, this multiplet, but I'm just going to give the answer. The answer is that you have to add here another uh, anti-symmetric self-dual tensor. It's complex and a single scalar D. So this T is a field, you can also call it T mu nu. I go from flat indices to curved indices with field binds. So this is a complex anti-symmetric field that would have six degrees of freedom, but it's anti-self-dual. That's what I mean by this minus. So, so that reduces it again to um, three complex or six real. And D is a real field, so that's one. And in the fermionic sector, we need an auxiliary field, which is a spinner, a chi, a alpha. And so this is four components times two, so that's eight. So if we add here, 16 plus eight is 24. And if we add here, one plus nine, that's 10. 19 plus five is also 24. So the wild multiplet consists of these bosonic fields and these fermionic fields, there is more gauge fields, but these are the dependent gauge fields. We had this uh, slightly confusing discussion this morning. There is gauge fields that are just like the spin connection that uh, can be eliminated because they depend on, uh, on, 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 on the other fields. They can be written in terms of the other fields. That can be understood in different ways, either via constraints or by equations of motions. I was not allowed to go on equations of motions is off shell, but that's the difference between second order and first order formalism. It would be still um, off shell in a uh, uh, second order formalism. Um, and so I, I didn't want to go into this constraint. There's also another way of saying we know that if we gauge translations or the Lorentz symmetries, eventually it's all part of the same local coordinate transformation, so surely the spin connection is not an uh, independent field, uh, etc. So 24 plus 24 is the counting of the, and this is the field content, and this field content is going to be important also in uh, future uh, lectures. So just to get a little bit of an intuition how this multiplet is realized, because I'm ju I've just written down fields, and so uh, these fields transform under all these transformations. Uh, I'm not going to write down everything, but let me just give some examples of transformations under S supersymmetry, because you might be least familiar with S supersymmetry. Then, for instance, we have that the dilatation gauge field transforms like eta bar i psi 
ui plus Hermitian conjugate um, that gauge field a mu i eta bar i. We have the same combination here, but this is the imag this is an imaginary part. Uh, we have the Gravitino. How does the Gravitino or the Gravitini transform under S supersymmetry by minus gamma mu eta i, etc., etc. So just to get, well, to make it a little bit more explicit, these are, this is how the S supersymmetry looks like. And th there's, there's also formulas for the variation of V and the variation of chi, etc. cetera. For instance, um, let me just write down one more delta chi a alpha, sorry, equals one over twelve gamma a b. And here you see this t, this anti-self dual uh, t field, epsilon i j eta j. Is there another transformation you need, uh, Samir? <laughs> or you haven't prepared your lectures yet? <laughs> Very good. Um, I can give more details uh, uh, if needed. This is just some uh, to to to. Um, so those closed off shell. If you compute the commutator, everything is off shell. This whole 24 plus 24 dimensional multiplet uh, is uh, um, is an off shell realization of the superconformal algebra. I was yes. Yes. Yes, you can get rid of it, yes. Uh, and in fact, that's also, but it's a gauge fixing condition. So when we go from the superconformal uh, 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 Lagrangian, there is B mu, but when I go to Poincaré supergravity, then I just set by hand B mu to zero. It's an admissible gauge choice, uh, and I'm fixing now the special conformal transformations, and then it's gone, yeah. Why all the other ones have Well, all the other one, well, yes, well, all the other ones you have to keep. Well, these will be composite connections uh, later on. We will see that uh, you have to eliminate them as well, not by gauge, but by, by solving their equations of motion. They will, uh, they will appear in the Lagrangian algebraically, and so they will become also, if you go on shell, they will become functions of the matter fields that I haven't introduced yet. Uh, Very good. So now the compensator, because I have here a multiplet, but I cannot write down an action, at least not a two derivative action. I cannot write down a, a two derivative action based on the while multiplet itself. Uh, the re well, there's maybe again different ways of explaining this, but in the simple example of just gravity, I needed to have a scalar field in the, uh, in the model in order uh, to compensate for the lacking uh, now, here there is a, uh, a scalar field D, but that's not the one that does the job. Uh, that's harder to see, perhaps, uh, or not, not, not possible with the information I've given you. But we need uh, compensating multiplets. And uh, and we need one vector multiplet. And a vector multiplet contains an A mu. It contains a complex scalar x, and it contains, um, well, a Dirac fermion or two Majoranas or two Wiles, uh, if you want. And we also need one hypermultiplet. And a hypermultiplet contains four real scalars, q, u. Q is a field, a scalar field, and u runs from one to four and it contains fermions zeta i. i is again runs from one to two. And um, so these are the, th that's a hypermultiplet. This is an on shell multiplet, but that's sufficient for the purposes of constructing this supergravity. Oh, so important is that a wire multiplet is off shell. So this a mu is becoming, is going to become the graviphoton. That's why I call this curly A mu and not capital A mu. Uh, the Grubby photon can be understood as part of the compensator uh, in a vector multiplet in n equals two. 
this one x here, I'm going to gauge it away. I'm going to gauge it away by using dilatations and, uh, um, sorry, not by dilatation. I'm going to gauge it away by u1. I have a u1 gauge symmetry here. And it turns out also that there is an equation of motion of d that, uh, um, I will explain that perhaps tomorrow, um, that allows us to get rid of this. So this can be gauged away or eliminate. It's, it should have eigenvalues. No. no. Actually, it's a complex scalar field. An n equals 2 vector multiplet has a gauge field, a complex scalar, and two, um, and two chiral spinners. This is the complex scalar, x. So there's no ij. Oh, um, you're quite right that this is, um, um, I did something wrong. There is, there is a triplet of, uh, yes. Uh, yij. A yij that is missing here. So, um, very good. Otherwise, this is not an off-shell multiplet. Yes, you're right. Yeah. So this one here uh, is going to be eliminated by u1. I can gauge fix. I have local symmetries here. This u1 and the equation of motion of d. How the equation of motion d comes about I have not explained to you. I'm, I'm just giving here some counting arguments how, how that all fits. Um, and then uh, this one is uh, 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 still back. This one is going to be eliminated by the equation of motion of chi i. We have here chi i's. And they have their equation of motion. This should not be part eventually of the Poincaré multiplet. Um, and so its equation of motion will, in fact, uh, also um, eliminate the fermionic part of the compensator. So um, these Qs um, are gauged away. with dilatations plus SU2R, because a hypermultiplet transforms under SU2R. And, um, and these here are gauged away by um, S supersymmetry, because I really wanted to have gravitinos that have 12 degrees of freedom. So I will augment this here. The 16 is 2 times 8. The 16 now becomes, uh, uh, this 8 becomes 12 again. Uh, so you get 2 times 12 is 24. And this one's I eliminate. So I basically reshuffle how the counting goes. I don't impose S supersymmetry here on my gravitini. I'm going to use S supersymmetry to gauge away this compensating. And then I have here my 2 times 12 degrees of freedom of a gravitino. So what is left over, let's see what is left over. Well, we have e mu a, um, and we have a mu. That's this gravity photon here. And all the rest here uh, in the bosonic sector is either gauged away or can be eliminated by equations of motion. So also this here is equation of motion, a mu and this one can be understood, uh, can also be eliminated by equation of motion. So we uh, are left over only with these uh, fields and with the fermions uh, psi mu i. So this is my 2 plus 2 being 4 bosonic degrees of freedom. And so this is 2 plus, well, 4 plus 4 on shell. And of course, I have not um, given you all the details of how to eliminate these V and A, but I want to do that, uh, I want to do that tomorrow. And so this is the wild multiplet. It's an off-shell multiplet. There's two compensator. 
one of these compensators contains the gravity photon and the rest is stuff that you get rid of in the gauge fixing procedure. But if you stay on shell, then these fields, auxiliary fields, remain in the game. Uh, and, um, and the hypermultiplet is, is completely gauged away and eliminated. So the coupling to matter and supergravity, the reason why I'm not doing this here in detail is that I want to do it tomorrow, but in more general details. I want to just change these numbers right here, number of vector multiplets plus one, and, and I want to introduce here number of hypermultiplets plus one, make it conformal. Uh, we know how to make conformal, at least classically conformal, uh, conformal vector multiplets. I will show you also how it goes with hypermultiplets. And then we do this gauge fixing procedure again, and then we end up with uh, non-minimal supergravity containing the Poincaré multiplet, but now it's coupled to physical vector multiplets and physical hypermultiplets. The compensator is gone, so I end up with NH hypermultiplets. This compensator is also gone. The only thing is left over is the gravity photon. So you have always one additional vector field on top of, which is a gravity photon, on top of the NV vector multiplets that you have uh, in the theory. And so I will sketch a little bit tomorrow how you do the, the construction of the action directly in more general terms by, by writing down uh, uh, the while multiplet couplings to all these multiplets combined together. And then I will show how the equation of motion for D and so on is constructed. And then I will do black holes. And I will do gauge supergravities. And then time will be gone. Thank you. Yeah, um.